So we're going to be using the, these four parent, we're going to call them parent functions, and we're going to be graphing um, their children, right? So we're going to have these four parent functions, and we're going to build functions from them, other functions that we'll call their, their children. So we've got x squared, square root x, absolute value of x, and um, this piecewise function, 3, and negative x plus 6. Okay, so we're going to talk about vertical shifts. So first, if I want to graph the function y equals j of x plus 3, I need an equation for j of x plus 3. So what would that be? Remembering that j of x is the function x squared. x squared plus 3, yep. y equals, I'm just going to make a substitution here, j of x equals x squared, so I substitute, replace the j of x with an x squared, and then I still have the plus 3. Okay, so y equals x squared plus 3. So changing the equation from y equals j of x to y equals j of x plus 3, is that an inside or an outside change to the parent function? Outside, yeah. In other words, if that, if that language doesn't make sense to you, think about the next sentence. Just another way of saying the same thing. Am I changing the inputs, the x's, or am I changing the y's, the outputs? The y's, yeah. So my y's used to be x squared, and now they're x squared plus 3. So I'm changing the y's of the parent function. How am I changing them? They're all increasing by 3. So my outputs <coughs> are outputs or y values are all increasing by 3. So I want to see what this change to the equation, where I increase all my y values by 3, I want to know how that's going to affect what the graph looks like. How do you, what do you predict? If I, if, if I make all my y values 3 bigger, what's, the, what's going to happen to the graph? It's going to shift how? Vertically, yeah. If I make all my y values bigger, everything is going to go up by 3. So let's look at, um, in GeoGebra, Okay, so here's my graph of um, y equals x squared, just a parabola. So this is j of x. Um, and then I've created this little slider, and this graph that's in red I called j1 of x, um, you know, the child of j of x is j1. Um, this is actually x squared plus c. It's just that when c is 0, it doesn't write anything. So right now, my two functions are exactly the same, because x squared and x squared plus 0 are the same function. But when I make this plus 3, it is exactly as we predicted. I shifted the graph of x squared, which is here in black, and then I also graphed the graph of y equals x squared plus 3, and I just moved the whole graph of x squared up 3 units. So let's fill in what happened here. So it says, j of x plus 3 represents a vertical, because we moved up, right? Vertical shift of the graph y equals j of x up, so circle up, um, by how many units? 3. Good. But what happens if I add or subtract a number other than 3? It will shift up or down depending on the value of the number I subtract. So I'm going to use the slider to see what happens. So if I use bigger c's, it just keeps going up, right? But when c is negative, so when c is 0, it's the exact same function. And when c is negative, it shifts down. That makes sense, right? Because adding a negative is like subtracting. So um, when c is negative, I get a vertical shift down. So let's fill that out. So j of x plus any number c, instead of using a specific number 3, I just have a c here now. It represents a vertical shift by c units. Yep. 
And when C is positive, so I'm, the shift is up. And when C is negative, the shift is down. <clears throat> so does that make sense? OK. So now I'm uh, switching, switching parent functions to H now. I was using J. H of x is um, the absolute value function. Okay, so I'm using the absolute value function here. I want to find the equation for h of x plus 3. y equals h of x plus 3. What would that be? Absolute value of x plus 3 all in the absolute values. Because this is just some function notation, and this says take x plus 3, the whole term, and plug that into the h function, which is absolute value. So this is absolute value of x plus 3. All right, so making that change to the equation, instead of um, y equals h of x, I have y equals h of the quantity x plus 3. Is that an inside or an outside change to my equation, to my parent function? It's inside, inside the parentheses. That's what I mean by inside or outside. So my inside parentheses used to just be an x. Now inside parentheses is an x plus 3. So I made an inside change. So in the previous example, my inside parentheses didn't change at all. I went from y equals j of x to y equals j of x plus 3. The plus 3 was outside the parentheses. So that's an outside change. OK, so this one's an inside change. And that means, are we changing the inputs or are we changing the outputs? We're changing the x values. We're adding 3 to every x value. So we're changing the inputs. How am I changing them? I'm adding 3 to every x value. OK, so I want to make a prediction here. What do you think is going to happen when I graph the absolute value of x and the absolute value of x plus 3? I'm changing the inputs by adding 3 to every x value. How is that going to affect the graph? OK, so you th we're going to have a horizontal shift that makes sense because we're changing the x's, right? So your um, Conjecture is that we're going to shift right three. Any other conjectures? Okay, so let's see what happens. I'm going to pull up the graph of the absolute value function and see. Okay, so right now the two functions are exactly the same because what's inside the absolute value is x plus zero. So this is my slider c. I'm going to move it to C equals 3. It shifted to the left 3. That's weird, right? Why do you think that happened? No, but yeah, right. It, that actually happens with any function. It's, it's not having to do with the absolute value, but that was a good guess. Yeah. Yes, OK. So think about what happened to the point 0, 0, right? I had this point 0, 0, right? So now I have to figure out what x value to plug in here that will give me a 0 as an output. So, so I want to, I'm just going to follow this vertex, right? It used to be that if I plugged in 0, I got 0. Into this function, what should I put in for x to make the output 0? Negative 3, right? So I used to put in 0. Now I have to put in negative 3. That's a shift 3 to the left. So I have to put in a number 3 smaller to get the same output that I used to get. So I end up with a shift 3 to the left. So the graph of h of x plus 3 represents a horizontal shift left by 3 units.
It's a great question. Let's see what happens if I make C negative, right? So if I subtract instead of add. Okay, so right now when I make C bigger, it just keeps going to the left. So here's, here it is back at zero. And if I make C negative now, so now I'm subtracting X minus, and now I'm moving to the right. So it kind of, we kind of always shift when you have an inside shift, uh, a horizontal shift, an inside change. It, it goes kind of the opposite way that you would expect it to go. So that's one way to, to try to remember what happens. Okay. So when I add or subtract a number other than 3, h of x plus c represents a horizontal shift by c units. And if C is positive, I should go left. And if C is negative, I should go right. Oh, no. All right, so I want you to take... Um, a minute or two, flip to this transformations of graphs activity, and I want you to do A through C. Figure out if this is your original parent function, match A through C to one of these graphs. All right, so let's look at these first three, A, B, and C together. So F of X plus 2, is that an inside change or an outside change? outside, not like outside of the parentheses, right? So that means it's going to be vertical, right? So this is a vertical shift, and vertical shifts acted normally, right? So it's going to go up to. So I'm looking for a picture of this guy, this original F, but up two units. So which of my pictures looks like that, but shifted up two units? This one, middle left, yep. So this one would be B. A. I don't know why I just said that. That one's A. Good. All right, and then for B, this is F of X plus 2. Is this an inside change or an outside change? Inside. We're inside parentheses this time. So that means it's going to be a horizontal shift, right? It's going to be horizontal. And horizontal ones are kind of the opposite of what you expect, so this is going to go left two units. So I'm looking for this picture, but shifted two units to the left. So which one looks like that? Top middle. And I'm actually just missing a little chunk of it. It got cut off, right, because I'm just looking at the same window for all of these. So if you draw that in, then you can see that it really looks the same. Oh, I cut off more than that. Sorry. Like that. Okay, and then C, is that an inside change or an outside change to the function? Inside, it's minus 2, which means I'm looking for a shift right 2. So which of these graphs looks like my original but moved 2 to the right? Bottom right. Everybody got those? Okay, good. All right, so we're pretty good with um, vertical and horizontal shifting. That's good. All right, so now we're going to talk about different kind of transformation that's not just shifting, but reflecting. So g of x, if you remember from the first page, g of x was the square root of x. All right, so I want to write equations for negative g of x and g of negative x. So negative g of x, is that inside or outside? Outside. It's outside the parentheses, right? So I'm going to put it outside the square root, negative square root x. Okay, and then g of negative x, that negative, is that an inside or an outside change? 
inside, which means I'm going to put that negative inside the square root. G of negative x means replace all your x's in the function g with negative x's. So this is the square root of negative x. So changing the equation g of x, y equals g of x to y equals negative g of x, that was an outside change. We were changing the outputs. And how did we change them? I made them negative. Took every output and made it negative. Or I could think, think of it as taking the opposite. Okay, so I took the opposite. of every y value, right? So if those y values were positive, I'd make them negative, and if they were negative, I'd make them positive, right? Because a negative of a negative is a positive. All right, and when I change the equation y equals g of x to y equals g of negative x, that was an inside change. I changed something inside the parentheses. That means that I'm changing the inputs changing the x's. And how am I changing them? Making them negative or taking the opposite. If they're already negative, I make them positive. Right? So I am took the opposite of every x value. <coughs> all right, so I'm going to graph all three equations. My original g of x, which is square root x, and negative square root x and the square root of negative x and see how they are all related. Okay, so here's just my original function g. This is the graph of the square root function. Now, if I'm going to put a negative outside, that means I'm changing y values, right? I'm take, making, taking all my y values and making them negative, the opposite of every y value. How do you think this graph is going to look when I put a negative in front of every y value? It will reflect over the x-axis, right? Every point, instead of 4, 2, I'm going to take that y value and make it negative, so it's going to become 4, negative 2. And I'm going to have a point down here or 9 comma 3, right, will become 9 comma negative 3 because I'm putting a negative in front of the output. Okay, so when I graph negative square root x, I get a reflection over the x-axis. So let's fill that in when I'm over here. So the graph of y equals negative g of x is a reflection over the x-axis. I made, that made all my y values negative. All right, so now, going back, we'll ignore this one for now. Now here's my function g of x. If I take every x coordinate and make it negative, right, because I'm now going to graph the square root of the opposite of x. So if I take every x coordinate and make it negative, what's going to happen to every point on this graph? it'll be reflected over y. Instead of 4 comma 2, I'm going to be at negative 4 comma 2. And that's exactly what happens when I graph the square root of negative x. So this works. You might think, wait, I, how can you take the square root of a negative, right? But it's because all of the x's are negatives themselves now. So this says, if I wanted to plug in a negative 4, I could take square root of negative negative 4, right? And that would give me the square root of positive 4, which is 2. So I get a reflection over the y-axis. OK, so now go back to the activity and do the right-hand column, g, h, and i match those to one of the graphs below. All right, so for um, g, 
That negative, is it an inside or an outside change? Outside. It's outside the parentheses. So it's an outside change, which means I'm changing y values, right? Making all my y values negative, so I'm flipping over the x-axis. Okay, so I'm looking for a picture that looks like my parent function, but reflected over the x-axis. So which picture looks like that? The first one, top left. So this one is G. Okay. And then for H, the negative is inside the parentheses. We now have an inside change, making all my X's opposite, which means I'm going to reflect over the Y axis. Okay, so which graph looks just like this one, but mirror image over the Y axis? middle yes because this you can tell this little bump moved from the left to the right right so that one's H and then I has a negative on the inside and the outside so I'm looking for both reflections over the Y and over the X so which graph do, does both flips it one way and then the other way Bottom, middle, I. <clears throat> so again, you can tell from the little bump, right? We've got this little bump here, and it has to move over to the other side, right? So it would look like that, and it has to flip. So it would be now under the x-axis like that. All right, so now we got shifting, we got reflecting. Now we're going to talk about vertical stretches and shrinks. All right, so remember j of x is the function x squared. Okay. So what is the equation for y equals 2 times j of x? y equals 2 times x squared, right? Just made a, a substitution. I replaced j of x with what it equals x squared. So changing the equation, y equals j of x to y equals 2 times j of x, is that an inside or an outside change? Outside. Okay, so it's outside the parentheses. So that means I'm changing outputs, changing y values. How am I changing those outputs? Multiplying by 2. So every y value is getting doubled. So predict, what do you think is going to happen? If you double every y value, what's my, what's my graph going to look like? Yeah, it's going to stretch. It's going to get taller, right? Every y value is going to double. So the x value is the same, but the y value gets bigger by a factor of 2. Okay, so let's take a look and see if that's, in fact, what happens. Okay, here it is. So right now, I just have j of x equals x squared, my original parent function, and then my child function, which is going to be something times x squared. So right now, it's 1 times x squared, which makes no change at all, right? Multiplying by 1 does nothing. But if I move this slider so that I'm multiplying by 2, there we go, you can see that it's like I grabbed the pieces of x squared and yanked it upwards. Right? I, I stretched it. So one way that we can see this is if I graph, if I graph 1, graph a point, 1 comma j of 1. So there's my point on my original graph. And that same point, I want to see what happens if I graph 1 comma j 1 of 1. So my point moved from 1, 1 to 1, 2, right? The y value doubled. And I could probably do it 2, 4, with, yeah, let's, let's look at um, what happens at x equals 2. Or negative 2. I'll do negative 2, comma, 
j of negative 2. So there's a point on my original function. And then for the same x value, I want to see what happens when I, go, when I go to my new function. So I have negative 2 comma j 1 of 2. Okay, so this point goes from negative 2, 4 to negative 2, 8. So my y coordinate doubled. And then what do you think happens if I do c is other than 2? Yeah, it'll just keep getting taller, yeah, as long as my c's are bigger than 1, right? And then at 1, it does nothing, right? At 1, my points are, you know, back on the same place and my graph looks identical. What happens if I go to the left of 1, if you multiply by a fraction? Yeah, when you multiply by a fraction, your number generally gets smaller, so my graph is now shrinking. Right, so let's do, say, 0.5. So my original point of uh, negative 2, 4, right, becomes negative 2, 2. My y value was cut in half. All right, so let's see if we can summarize what happened here. So I graph them both. Two graphs are related to each other because the graph of y equals 2 times j of x is a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Right? I double, I multiplied all the y values by 2. So that's why I use the term factor because that indicates multiplication, right? factor of 2. And when I multiply by a number other than 2, and so I'm graphing c times j of x, just a random number c, I still get a vertical, and it's either going to be a stretch or a shrink, so we can't circle because we don't know. It depends. I'm going to get a vertical stretch or shrink by a factor of c. And when c is bigger than 1, we get a stretch. Because you're multiplying by a big number, it's going to get bigger, so we get a stretch. And if you multiply by a number between 0 and 1, like a fraction, you get a shrink. Right? So multiplying all your y values by a small number makes all your y values smaller. Multiplying all your y values by a big number makes your y values bigger, so you get a stretch. Okay? All right, let's look at um, horizontal stretches and shrinks. All right, k of x was that crazy piecewise function. k of x was 3 and negative x plus 6, and this was if 0 is less than or equal to x less than 3. And if 3 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 6. So that's my original function k of x, just jotting it down from the first page. What is the equation for k of 2x? Change all the x's to 2x's, exactly. So k of 2x, All that means is take every x and replace it with a 2x. So 3, there's no x's there, so that stays a 3. Here I take my negative x and I replace it with negative 2x. And here, in my if parts, I have to do it also, replace the x's with 2x's. So in this case, if 2x is between 0 and 3, and if 2x is between 3 and 6. But those are just compound inequalities, and it's kind of weird to put a 2 it. Like, let's solve it, right? If, if 2x is between 0 and 3, what can I sandwich x between? Zero and one and a half. Yeah, divide, divide all three pieces of this equation by 2, and I would get 0 less than or equal to x less than 1.5, right? Just divide everything by 2. 
And here, if 2x is sandwiched between 3 and 6, what can I sandwich x between? 1.5, 3. Okay. I just divided each piece of my compound inequality by 2. Just solved it for x. So I have this new piecewise function. All right, so when I make this change, replacing all my x's with two x's, is that an inside or an outside change? Inside, which means I'm changing the inputs, right? How am I changing them? Yeah, well, I mean, when I did this part, I end up cutting my domain in half, right? It, I'm doubling all my inputs, but a result it results in having the domain. My domain used to go from 0 to 6, and now it goes from 0 to 3, right? So it results in half having the domain. So before even graphing, I now know that my graph is not going to go from 0 to 6 anymore. It's going to go from 0 to 3. So it's a shrink. So multiplying by 2 on the inside, we're going to um, hypothesize that it's going to cause the graph to horizontally shrink. So we'll take a look at the graphs. OK, so here I have k of x right here. And then instead of um, plugging in the new formula, I just told the new function is going to be k of cx. And if I make c2, right now it's 1, so these are the exact same function. But if I make c2, so my child function is k of 2x, you can see that I, I caused a shrink. It ha I cut it in half. So this long piece that used to go from 0 to 3, now it goes from 0 to 1 and a half. And this point that was at 0, 6, now it's at 0, 3. So I halved every y value. I mean x value. I halved every x value. All right, so let's see. So in GeoGebra, I graphed the 2, and it represents a vertical or horizontal. Horizontal because I changed inputs, those always result in horizontal changes to the graph. Stretch or a shrink? Shrink of the graph y equals kx by what kind of a factor? Half, yeah. Multiplying, if, if I said a factor of 2, that would indicate multiplying by 2, right? But it's a factor of a half. It got half as big as it used to be. OK, so what happens if you multiply by a number other than 2? Well, let's, let's look and see what happens. Yeah, bigger numbers are going to shrink it more. So the bigger I make C, the smaller that red graph gets. Right. So now when C is 3, my graph is now a third of the size it used to be. Because this point used to be at 6, now it's at 2, one third the size. Okay. This point used to be at 3. At x equals 3, now it's at x equals 1. So it's a third of the size it used to be. All right, and when c is 1, the two graphs are exactly the same. But what if I go less than 1? Now it starts stretching, right? Like if I do 0.5, when c is 0.5, I stretched it by what factor? How much bigger is it? I doubled it. So this point here that was at 6, 0, now it's at 12, 0. And this point that was at 3, 3, now it's at 6, 3. Okay, so small c values, when you multiply by a small value of c inside, you get a horizontal stretch. Okay, so k of cx represents a horizontal Stretch or a shrink, <clears throat> depending on the c value. Okay, and what's my factor? 1 over c, it's the reciprocal, right? When, it, when I was multiplying by 2, my factor was a half. When I multiplied by 3, my factor was a third. When I multiplied by a half, my factor was 2. I doubled, right? 
So my factor is going to be 1 over C. And when C is bigger than 1, do you get a stretch or a shrink? Shrink. And when C is between 0 and 1, you get a stretch. All right, so to summarize, hopefully this will help you remember all the rules of what happens. When you add or subtract a constant, that leads to a shift. If you multiply by a constant, that leads to either to a stretch or a shrink. Negatives cause reflections. Now, inside changes or changes to the input always result in horizontal changes to the graph. And these changes are always the opposite of what you'd expect. Right? If you add something, you shift left. Multiply by a big number, it actually causes a shrink. Multiply by a small number, it actually causes a stretch. Anytime you make an inside change, it kind of does the opposite of what you think it will do. Outside changes or changes to the output of the function result in vertical changes to the graph. Vertical shifts or vertical stretches or shrinks. And these changes are generally exactly what you'd expect. Yes, yeah, so if it was plus 2, you'd shift up 2. If it was times 2, everything would get bigger. Yeah. So this is sort of my little guide to helping remember how they work. And then there's this handy-dandy summary of transformations that is in your textbook. Um, and I just copied it. And so one of these two, right, whichever one helps you more, might be handy to have on your cheat sheet for the test, right? or to have in front of you while you're doing your homework. All right, now, finish this activity. Do the middle column, D, E, and F. <coughs> um, we'll quickly go over this last bit of the activity, and then I'm going to show you a couple things in GeoGebra that you're going to want to use for the project I just handed out. All right, so now we're doing D, E, and F. So D, I have both an inside change and an outside change. The minus 2 is inside, and that indicates what kind of a transformation? It's, it's subtraction, which means it's a shift, right? Multiplication would lead to a stretch. So this is a shift right to units, right? And then the plus 2 on the outside, that would be an up 2. So this, I should take my graph and shift it right to and up to. So this point here is going to land here. So which of my graphs looks like that? The third one, yep. yep. So let's just double check. This point here, if I go right to, up to, would land right here. Yeah, good. So this is D. And then 2 times f of x. Multiplication leads to a stretch or a shrink. It's outside, which means it's vertical. So this is going to be a vertical, which one, stretch or shrink? Stretch, because vertical changes are exactly what you expect them to do. So I'm multiplying by 2, so I expect things are going to get bigger. Right? So this is going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. So it's going to look just like this guy, but longer. So which one would be a vertical stretch. Here we go, bottom left. That is E. So it looks just like the top one, just like the parent, except every Y value has been doubled. So it stretched the whole thing. And then we could get the last one by process of elimination, but let's talk it through anyway. So I have F of 2 times X. It's an inside change, which means that something horizontal is happening. It's multiplication, which means it's either a stretch or a shrink. It's inside, which means it's going to be the opposite of what I expect. So multiplying by 2, I would expect to make things bigger, but it's actually going to make things smaller, because inside changes do the opposite of what I expect. So this is going to be a horizontal shrink by a factor of what? 1 half, yeah. Horizontal shrink by a factor of 1 half. So I have to look at this original. Shrink it by a factor of half. So I want to shrink it so it's going to be squished horizontally. And that would be this third one on the 
third one, second one down on the right. And that is um, F. Yeah, we did it. Not bad. All right, so um, your homework tonight is class 17. Several people mentioned to me that they saw that class 20 was due today. I changed it. It's not. It's due two weeks from today. <laughs> so I changed it. It just is the other section did it early. So I changed it for us. Um, so your homework for this week is just going to be eight, 17 and 18 due Wednesday of next week.